This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Thanks, Ann. Hello. Well, last year um, I made a presentation on best practices in data centers. So this year I'm going to um, follow that on with a with basically a presentation on applying those best practices to a case study at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. But sort of the context for 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 this session, which includes uh, laboratories and data centers, uh, this slide just kind of shows that. All buildings for high-tech industry are, 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 are energy hogs. They're uh, 10 to 100 times more energy intensive per square foot than, say, a typical office building or, or a classroom. So that's one of the reasons we're interested. And the other reason is that there's, a, there's frankly, a lot of opportunities. In fact, some people say even low-hanging fruit in, in these kinds of buildings. For starters, LBL feels the pain. Uh, we're building a new supercomputer center that had this projection uh, for its energy load. In the turn of the century, you can see that the energy use was pretty much uh, in the noise. It certainly wasn't competing with salaries and the cost of the computers. But as time goes on, we're up to about uh, 6 megawatts now, and it was projected to grow to 38 megawatts. And just in perspective, our entire campus of, uh, of uh, over 2.5 million square feet has a 13 megawatt load. So this one 40,000 square foot building was going to uh, uh, quadruple our entire uh, campus's energy use. Sort of following up uh, Regent R Reese's uh, comments this morning, um, these are some quotes from Dr. Chu, uh, who's now the Secretary of Energy, uh, left LBL as our, our director for several years. Um, as he was going into DOE, he pointed out that we're certainly in a mess right now. The environment's the reason that he joined the Department of Energy, and I think what's most important is his quote, we simply can't fail. And he definitely took this attitude at LBL, and when he learned of these projections, he strongly negotiated <laughs> with our uh, um, computing science department and uh, convinced them that um, at LBL this wasn't going to happen, at least on his watch, and I guess it's still his watch since he's still, the, he's still in our food chain. And uh, um, we're capping our energy use on this building at 17 megawatts, which is still a big problem, uh, but it's better than half uh, what we were. So what we're trying to do is change the paradigm from, um, you know, say a Hummer, where computers wanted to be bigger, faster, more powerful uh, to be successful, to sort of the Prius model where we can get to where we need to go, but maybe do it with a little less energy. So in data centers, there's huge opportunities. 20 to 40 percent savings is typical. With aggressive strategies, especially in new construction, we can achieve better than 50 percent savings. And besides the energy savings, we extend the life and the capacity of the infrastructure. Uh, but one of the problems is, is that data centers uh, have energy use indexes all over the map. And you really can't tell from BTUs or watts per square foot whether it's good or bad. So there are some develop or emerging metrics I'm just going to mention one called the Data Center Infrastructure Efficiency, DCIE. And this is, in essence, the percentage of power that's coming into the building that actually makes it to the boxes where the computation is done. So if you had a, a server and you put it outside on your patio and plugged it into the wall with no power conditioning equipment like a UPS system, the DCIE would be 1 or 100%. But unfortunately, we do a lot of stuff to the power in a data center, and we, we spend a lot of energy to take the heat out of a data center. And it's very typical to have at least the amount of energy going to the, the, the IT equipment being used in infrastructure. So uh, this slide shows actually not a random set. This is 20-some uh, data centers that, that LBL benchmarked. And I think just the nature of the people that would work with LBL tend to be on the conservative side. So the average here is 57 percent. The national average is more like 50. Um, in any event, uh, you can see that the best data centers 
um, three quarters or more of the energy actually made it to the IT equipment, and in the worst data centers, uh, a third or less of the energy made it to the IT equipment. So this is kind of a good metric to look at the infrastructure of, uh, of the data center. And like I mentioned before about the capacity, I mean, LBL is reaching uh, our capacity, especially of our, of our enterprise data center, um, because scientific computing is growing. We're moving from uh, a lab bench uh, science to com uh, computational science, speeding up the process of R&D. Um, we're trying, and I think all the campuses are as well, to reduce the number of, of um, clusters in offices, in laboratories, et cetera, and consolidate them and move them into uh, central uh, data centers. This is, uh, allows for lower cost, higher energy efficiency, and increased cybersecurity, but it's putting a strain on those, those, those infrastructure facilities, the data centers themselves, so they're, they're running out of power, cooling, uh, and, and, and space, actually, in many cases. So in, in terms of applying the best practices that I presented last year, um, the project status is that we formed a partnership with our, uh, with our CIO, our computing science division, our energy efficiency researchers and facilities. Um, and, and taking a look at two of our primary data centers, the NERSC is our supercomputer center. It actually had a pretty high DCIE already. 72% of the power makes it to the IT equipment. That's partially because we have a central plant, and central plants tend to be more efficient than crack units or computer room air conditioners. If I say an acronym and, and that, that you don't understand, just shout out and ask me to, because sometimes I'll just skip over it and forget that things like cracks aren't obvious to everybody. But um, anyway, computer room air conditioners, um, in, in, in our 50B1275 data center, it has a 59 to 64, let's say 60% uh, DCIE. It's still pretty good. Um, one of the reasons is although it has crack units, um, it, it, they're, they're tower cooled rather than air cooled, and that gives them a little bit more efficiency. So we started off with some pretty efficient uh, data centers, but we feel there's a lot of opportunity to do better. So this was the list of um, best practices I presented last year, and today I'm gonna um, focus on those that are bolded, um, because those are the ones that we um, have at least started to apply at LBL. In the first area, you wanna look at the IT equipment itself, um, and IT load can be controlled. We can consolidate, and, and that's a huge savings. Oftentimes in a data center or, or even in a distributed in closets, the, the equipment is only utilized at the five or under percent level, so by consolidating uh, uh, data centers and, and using the resources more effectively, uh, we can actually decrease the number of boxes and improve efficiency. We can buy servers that are more efficient, basically on a flop per watt basis, or, we, or specifically we can um, buy power supplies that are more efficient, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, software efficiency, well, there's sort of the basic that, you know, software just is gluttonous in terms of, of computing resources and convincing uh, the Microsofts of the world to write more efficient software, but that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about software like virtualization software or made software that's, that is designed to utilize the hardware more, more efficiently or effectively. Um, power management, which basically says if, if, if that server is, say, a web server and, it's, and, and there's peak periods and when, the, when it's not being utilized, that it can at least components of the server can go into sleep modes or, low or, or lower its reduction or, in an ideal situation, go completely down. Uh, and then also reconsidering the redundancy of power supplies. A lot of times it's just a standard spec in IT that you order servers with, with dual power supplies and it, it's really worth questioning uh, whether you need that. So the bottom line here is all these things on the IT side, anything you can do to reduce the load there has that multiplier effect back to the DCIE. So if, if for every kilowatt you're using on your IT, there's another kilowatt for infrastructure. If we reduce the kilowatt on the IT, we've actually saved two kilowatts. So that's worth remembering and, and, and can be uh, a big deal. One of the keys, and I, actually I kind of conclude on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a I'll give it to you now, is getting the two sides together, getting the facilities people together with IT people, because the IT people make their purchasing decision independent of the impact on facilities and, and the oftentimes on the impact of energy efficiency. So getting people together as we did in terms of a team and having them talk to one another and, and understand each other's needs and uh, impacts is, is really a useful thing to do. Okay, so from, from this point on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on infrastructure 
Um, that other half of the, uh, of the coin, I mean, the IT equipment is typically refreshed every three or four years. We have lots of opportunities to do better, whereas the infrastructure, you know, is there for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and so that the, the decisions we make there have a, a longer-term impact. And, 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 but, but the, again, they're both um, golden opportunities. Anyhow, the first uh, best practice is to use IT to save energy in IT uh, because most operators of data centers have very little information coming at them in terms of how their infrastructure is working. It's not like their, their equipment, their computers, they can monitor the heck out of them. They have all sorts of nice visuals and, and, and they get good feedback, but we don't have the same kind of information to do what everybody says we need to do. You can't manage what we don't measure. So if we could provide the same level of monitoring and visualization of the physical space as we have on the IT environment, uh, that would allow us to measure and track performance metrics like DCIE and then spot problems before they result in high energy cost and, and downtime. So at LBL, we've, uh, we've deployed a 700-point a um, wireless sensor system um, manufactured by SynapseSense. It provides temperature, humidity, uh, and underfloor pressure and current. And then that allows us to a much better uh, handle on what's going on in our data center. And this is like an example of, uh, of the visualization at, at one point at, at four different levels, under the floor, at, at, the lower in, um, at the low part of the racks, at the midpoint, and at the high point. In one, in one picture here, you can get the temperature profile throughout the data center. And what, what users are going to be concerned about are the hot spots, because these tend to be where the problems occur, uh, where you have a little bit of overheating, and, uh, um, and, and that will cause, first the servers will go into a low clock speed, and then ultimately they'll go off. So this is what um, data center operators are concerned about, and it's one of the reasons why when you go into a data center, it's awfully, oft, often cold. So, sp so speaking of, uh, of temperatures, who's been in a data center? Most of you, good. How many people have gone into a cold data center? Okay, that's an opportunity because the equipment in a data center can operate from 64 degrees to 81 degrees. So if we're operating at the high end of the recommended range, we're uncomfortably warm, but the, but the IT equipment's doing just fine, thank you. There can be a, a few excursions even all the way up to 90 degrees, so there's a buffer zone here, but if you stay in the recommended zone, everybody's happy. And unfortunately, most data centers don't operate in that zone or not at the high end of the zone. They operate at the low end of the zone. Or actually, a lot of times, the lower, uh, the lower racks are, or, the, or the IT equipment in the lower racks are seeing temperatures in the 55 to 60 degree range. So the key is to eliminate the hot spots, which then allows the operator to reduce the overall temperature. So you can't just go into a data center and to save energy, raise the temperature. Well, sometimes you can, but it's usually not a good idea. You usually want to first do air management uh, which, is, which is another one of the best practices. So typically a lot more air, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this slide to describe those bullets. There's a lot more air circulating through uh, the computer room air conditioners, the crack, whoop, 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 the crack, here. Now here a new acronym, instead of crack units, which is computer room air conditioners, which typically have the compressors in the conditioned space. So not only are you having to take the heat away from the computers, but you're also having to take the heat away from the compressor that's that's providing the cooling. In a craw computer room air handler, this is just a fan curl unit. So there's a, a chiller plant, uh, you know, remote from the data center. Anyhow, the air comes from the, from the top of the room, goes into the top of the craw unit, it's pushed down, it's cooled off, and then supplies the underfloor plenum. A lot of times the air circulating here is two or three times the air that's required to cool the boxes. Um, so then what happens is a lot of the air, instead of going through the box, just bypasses the box and short circuits back to the craw unit. Another problem is the air goes over the top, and, and ignore this, this air barrier because this is the best practice, but typically that's not there, and the air goes over the top, I'm sorry, it goes through the box, comes out warm here, but instead of going back over to here, somehow it either goes into this row or an adjacent row, and the, and the hot air then goes back into the, into, the, into the IT equipment. So it's not uncommon, again, to have these hot spots that are just created because of poor air management. So it's typical to see the supply air temperature in data centers, very cool, 45 to 55 degrees, your feet are cold, um, the air comes in, it gets mixed, and then the return temperature is often 60 to 70. What we'd really like is to have the supply air in the upper end of that uh, recommended zone 
70 to 80 and have the return air really warm, um, 95 to 105. So you should be wearing cutoffs and, and t-shirts in a data center rather than um, uh, you know, ski jacket. So for us, the process started with uh, doing some assessments. We followed the uh, DOE Save Energy Now assessment protocol. Then we performed computational fluid dynamic CFD modeling that gives us a better understanding of how air flows and where the problems are. And then we deployed the wireless monitoring system. And then with those tools, we identified opportunities for improvements. And instead of going through the list, I'm going to describe these as we go here. The first one, the first improvement, <clears throat> and by the way, most of the graphics associated with these improvements are from that monitoring system. So we're going back to using IT uh, uh, to save energy in IT. So installing blanking plates um, prevents the air from going from the back, the hot side of the, of the rack, through back through the inside of the rack to the cold side. So blanking panels are just basically little plastic dams that keep the hot air on one side and the cold air on the other side. And in this case, we installed one 12-inch blanking panel, and we reduce the temperature in the cold aisle 20 degrees. Another opportunity in most data centers is as, as times change and conditions, you know, get warm, the operator puts in more permeable tiles. So that, the, you know, the, the, the permeability of the tile kind of dictates how much air is going up through uh, that row. So if this, whoop, 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 whoop. If this row were getting hot, the operator might replace um, these, these tiles with, with a tile that has more, perme per more permeability. Um, th that works to a point, and then you start running out of air, and then you've got you know, a lot of air floating up, but nothing's making it to the top. So, so this is one of those things that it kind of works a little bit at the beginning, and then it kind of falls apart, and then the operator puts in another crack unit because they think they need more capacity, when reality is they have plenty of capacity, they just have too porous of a floor. So by, by tuning the tile uh, carefully, um, we were able to re increase the underfloor pressure quite a bit. On this slide, you can see the increase in pressure under the floor, and, and actually decrease the, uh, by decreasing the air, the permeability here, we actually decreased the temperature at the top of the rack. So it was a, it was a, double, a double benefit um, through floor tile tuning. Um, the next thing we did is we took the, the return air, instead of letting it float up to the ceiling and kind of mix in with, with cold air and, and, and that sort of thing and, and feed down into the wrong aisles, we, uh, we used the ceiling plenum as a return air plenum, and then we enclosed the space. This is the existing crack unit where the air would come in at the top. Then we enclosed that space, so now there's separation between the hot return air that's above the ceiling. And it, can everybody hear me when I turn around? I hope, good. Um, it, 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 it returns to the ceiling plenum and then goes down this chute here and, and keeps that isolation. Then on the hot aisle, we put in uh, some, um, some you know, grills. So this encourages the warmest air from the hot aisle to go up into the ceiling space and, and over to the crack units. Or, the other thing we, we're starting to do, we haven't completed, is, um, and actually there's a lesson learned here, uh, is to use these air curtains so that, um, so that we can, again, do a better job. I mean, the, the perfect solution is a completely isolated hot and cold aisle so that there's no mixing between the two. Um, and, and, you know, that's, so we're working towards that direction. The lesson learned here I'll mention is that these curtains were just a hair too high a smoke rating. And it didn't get caught, um, you know, during the design phase. And, and unfortunately, now it's been caught, and we're having to replace all these curtains with new curtains uh, that meet the fire marshal's requirements for uh, um, smoke. Um, and, and also, obviously, you have to deal with your, your, your fire suppression system. Some fire suppression systems in data center like boxed-in isolation, so actually the isolating the hot and cold aisles you know, is, is a plus for fire suppression. But, but if not, these are designed with um, Fuse, whoop, 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 fusible, uh, fusible connections, so they'll drop out uh, during a fire. Um, but unfortunately, these, when they when they melt or whatever, gave off too much smoke. So this is this is the ideal situation where we're trying to get to, uh, where we have where we have isolation, um, either with curtains uh, um, and with the ceiling between the hot and the cold. We'll supply the air as warm as we can. It, 
and the idea here is the temperature here would be the same as the temperature here because there's no mixing uh, with the warm air from, uh, you know, from the other side of the IT equipment. We want to use free cooling whenever we can, um, which means no compressors. Uh, the water side economizer where we use water from a cooling tower to cool the IT equipment is the easiest in a retrofit, uh, but outside air uh, economizers probably is even a little bit uh, better from an energy efficiency standpoint. Um, the goal, the ultimate goal would be to uh, get rid of chillers in data centers. The benefit would be obviously a lower first cost. We don't have to buy a chiller. A lower operating cost because um, uh, free cooling or economizer cooling is much uh, more cost effective than than compressor cooling. And third, even an increase in reliability because the more components you have in a system, there's, a, there's more failure points. We've started to use the free cooling on a liquid-based system in retrofit. Uh, we've run both chilled water and tower water to our data center um, so we can cool on either one. We're really trying to get by with using just tower water. We've installed these racks that come with um, uh, uh, coils in the back so that the air is heated through the, through the IT equipment and then before it leaves the rack, it's cooled down. And so far, we've been able to cool it 100%, <clears throat> but we haven't really experienced a really long heat storm to see kind of what happens then. So if need be, we can, we can boost it with a chiller, with chilled water, but we're trying to get by with tower water. But in any event, either one, whether we're using chilled water or tower water, it's significantly more efficient than the crack units that we had previously. In our new data center, the new supercomputer center that I mentioned, um, we're going to cool with outside air. There's 93% of the hours in Berkeley um, that can be done. Um, we're also using some direct evaporative cooling for uh, um, pre-cooling or, or, uh, and also for humidity control. And then, and then we're also putting in <clears throat> a four-pipe system, which means that we can run uh, either chilled water or tower water to the devices in the, in the computing center because there's a trend now back towards liquid-cooled uh, computers, and we want to have the infrastructure ready to take advantage of that. The predicted performance here is going up to a DCIE of 95% over the year. That's an annual energy, uh, uh, you know, metric. On those peak days where we may have to use a little bit of chiller um, energy, uh, it, the, the, the uh, DCIE is 88%. The next uh, best practice is uh, improving humidity control. Um, the bottom line is we shouldn't need humidity control in a data center. There's no source of humidity and no, uh, um, and no, uh, and no way, or it shouldn't be, there should be no removal of humidity and there's no source of humidity. Uh, but unfortunately, many data centers have humidity control and it creates a lot of energy uh, waste. Uh, what you find often is equipment fighting one another, one crack unit in the cooling, uh, in, the, in the dehumidification mode and another in the humidification mode. And I think I have a sample of that. This is our data center uh, with the crack units. And uh, um, um, out of six units, three were cooling only, two were cooling with humidification, and one was cooling with dehumidification. So they were fighting at one another. What we did is we simply disconnected the, the, dehu the humidity control system and, and there was an impact. You can see the humidity went down 3%. We can live with that. That's not a problem. But our crack power went down 28%. So you can see, the, you can see how much of an impact uh, those units fighting one another had. Now I'm moving to improving the power chain. We want to increase the distribution voltage. Um, the higher the voltage, the less the losses. So we're going to 480 volts in our new uh, supercomputer facility. We want to improve the power supply efficiency. Um, this is a typical curve. And you can see it's pretty good out here which, where it's rated, but then as you get lower and lower on the, on the load, the efficiency drops off. What happens is oftentimes the power supply is, you know, you, the IT equipment might really require 150 watts, but the power supply is put in at 300 watts. Sort of like garage door and, and disposer ratings, you know, people think the bigger it is, the better. So it's usually at least double size. So that means if you only had one, you'd be here at this 50% point. But people put two power supplies in typical servers for redundancy, and they run them both hot. So the operating point is here, and you can see that you're really on that steep portion of the curve. So oftentimes, you know, 30 or more percent of the energy is just being wasted in the power supply. Same is true on the UPS, similar kind of curves on the UPS. So you either want to re rethink the redundancy requirements, or in the case of UPS, rethink whether you even need them at all. We, we try to minimize our use of, of UPS and, and just uh, suffer with the losses and the few power failures that we have. 
So redundancy is needed for highly reliable systems, um, but we need to understand what it costs and is it worth it. Um, it puts us down that efficiency curve, as I mentioned. Um, so it's just something to reconsider. These are actual test results of UPS systems. You can see in the, in the regime of non-redundancy, non getting pretty good efficiency. Over here where you have redundant um, UPS, typically if it's lower than 40%. We had one that was under 50% efficient. That means over half of all the energy going to this data center uh, was being wasted at heat in the UPS system. Big opportunity. I promised that I'd get back to uh, things we could do in terms of getting people to talk, using life cycle total cost of ownership, documenting design intent so people understand why there's a hot aisle and why there's a cold aisle, benchmarking and tracking performance, eating your spinach. I mean, those things like the blanking plates and sealing up leaks and maintaining your cracks. This is stuff nobody likes. Everybody knows they should do it, but nobody likes it, right? So it's eating your spinach, uh, recommissioning, and then keeping an eye on emerging technologies. So that concludes my talk. Did, and should I take one or two questions? Yeah, let's we'll see if we have a brief or burning question. So if you have still now, we're also going to have Q&A at the end of our talk today. Nick? <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> You definitely don't do it without the IT people at the table um, participating. Um, interestingly, you know, we have, there's two data centers, there's two different groups, and the nurse people were definitely the hardest ones to convince because they were the supercomputers, bigger is better, more powerful is better, we're rewarded on, you know, the size of our engine, not how much power it takes, whereas, the, whereas on the enterprise side, you know, they, they were feeling the pain of, 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 of not having enough capacity, but actually now our nurse people are feeling that pain as well. So you just got to find out what the hot buttons are. Uh, capacity is often one of them, um, but get them on your, t you know, you got, you got to work with them. And um, fortunately, almost all the, you know, all the IT companies, the Dells and the Suns and stuff like that provide the service. So if, if you lack credibility, I mean, there's a lot of consultants out there that, you know, talk the language, but that's important too, because if, if they feel you're going to compromise the security of their data center, you, you know, you, you don't even get in the door, like you say. Another question? Uh, what do you know about the future of hardware operation centers and what you expect? Well, we've, uh, that's definitely on the R&D end, and we've demonstrated a complete DC power data center at Sun Microsystems, and we're now looking at um, demonstrating it at a full-scale application, actually at UC San Diego. Um, and there is that potential because when power comes in at a data center, it comes in at, at a, a high voltage AC, it's converted to DC, goes into a battery bank, then out of the batteries it's converted back from DC to AC to a high voltage AC where it's distributed through the data center to power distribution units that transform it down to a lower voltage AC, low voltage being 12240. Then it goes into the power supply in the box where it's converted from AC back to DC, elevated in uh, and, and voltage to 360, and then it's stepped down to all the different voltages that are needed in the box. So the point is it goes through many transformations, and if the, the, the more of those you have, the less efficient it is, because each one takes a couple of percent. So eliminating the DC to AC to DC conversions can save, you know, 5 to 15 percent, and it's an easy save, and we hope to see a trend in that direction. One more? We eliminated all dehumidification, and that's not uncommon in the Bay Area. The key is to eliminate the inadvertent dehumidification. If, you, if your cooling system is using normal chilled water temperatures, you're dehumidifying when you don't want to dehumidify. So you've got to, oftentimes you've got to increase your, your cooling water supply and you know, design your coils and stuff for that. So if you design for no inadvertent dehumidification, there's no source of humidity other than the outside air. So if you're in a very humid climate, say like New Orleans or something, um, there you may want to dehumidify the makeup air. Um, but, but in the Bay Area, many, many data centers are running with no humidity control. The other thing I might mention is, oh, just one more point here. Uh, crack units come standard like 55% plus or minus 5%. Humidity, very tight humidity control was very important 
back in the days where we used cards in data centers. Paper is very sensitive to humidity. Those requirements have stuck around. Now if you talk to your server manufacturer, say for example HP servers, they go, their specification range is 10 to 90 percent. I mean, think about it. That's basically no humidity control. You can use it outdoors. But we haven't changed with those times. We're still using an interior spec that's based on paper. So that's the other issue is that, that the range has gotten much wider. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, action-oriented benchmarking, and uh, we, I like to uh, tag it as quick and sometimes messy ways to identify uh, efficiency opportunities in laboratories. Uh, so quick outline of the talk, um, talk a little bit about what action-oriented benchmarking is, um, and then how we actually use it to uh, identify efficiency opportunities in laboratories, and we'll use an example of two buildings uh, at LBL that we began to apply this on. And uh, finally, I'll have some takeaways. Um, benchmarking, for the, how many of you have heard the term energy benchmarking or have used it? Good. So you, you all know what it is. Um, and it's very widely used. So we'll move on. So it's important to understand that there are obviously many different um, applications for benchmarking because the term really means different things to different people. And so once you drill down, you'll see here again, you know, you may be just trying to identify outliers. Um, or uh, on the other hand, you may actually be trying to value property. Uh, based on uh, uh, efficiency metrics and so on. So obviously the, the implications in terms of how accurate your benchmarking is, um, you, you want to have a much more accurate apples to apples comparison if you're trying to do something like property valuation. So benchmarking has been around for a bit, um, where, but it's mostly focused on whole building benchmarking at the campus or the building level. And what we're trying to do is to extend it then to also look at benchmarking at the system and the component level so that you can begin to identify efficiency opportunities. And really what we're trying to do here with action-oriented benchmarking is to say that um, we're familiar with whole building benchmarking. It's been around for a long time. It helps screen facilities for overall efficiency performance. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have detailed investment grade audits. That's, you know, once you've identified, oh my gosh, my, my building's a dog. Uh, now let me go and do a detailed audit. Well, what we're suggesting is that something in between, detailed audits tend to be very resource intensive. It's boots on the ground, detailed analysis, you know, going and looking inside plenums and so on and so forth. And what we're trying to do is to do something that's in between, um, that's um, uh, more than whole building benchmarking. Benchmarking at the system level helps prioritize your efficiency opportunities, and especially important when you have a large portfolio of facilities. At LBL, for instance, we have, um, in fact, I'll just go to the next slide, we have over 100 buildings on our campus. And we've got various Department of Energy and other federal mandates to reduce efficiency by 3% every year for the next 10 years in all these buildings. Well, where does one begin? Uh, and of course, there's anecdotal information out there. The facilities folks who've been there for 30 years know, for instance, that, uh, oh, well, I know that that building's a real dog. We've had huge problems with it. And that's good. But if you really want to have a portfolio-based strategy, you need to kind of do portfolio analysis. And of course, simple portfolio analysis, again, many of you have probably done this, is to just line up your buildings in terms of total energy consumption, not yet in terms of uh, uh, energy intensity, but just total consumption. And you begin to find some quick things, the classic 80-20 rule. In this case, I think um, this is the cumulative percentage of energy. Uh, sorry, this is just electricity. We did the same thing for gas. But anyway. Uh, we found that six buildings out of our 100 more plus buildings take up 50% of the total energy on our campus. And again, that, that may often be the case for some of your uh, campuses too. Um, and, uh, and I think in terms of 80%, it was about 18 buildings uh, essentially accounted for, 18 out of the, more, again, more than 100 plus, accounted for about 80% of uh, the energy use. So clearly that's where you want to begin uh, to focus. And then you begin to look at EUIs, and you can overlay the energy use intensity on um, overall energy consumption. And of course, where you want to focus are the highest priority are those buildings that are uh, very high in terms of uh, actual total energy consumption, as well as high in terms of energy use intensity. And those are clearly the first priority. And the next priority then might be just uh, buildings that may not be too high in terms of energy use intensity, but are still a big part of total energy consumption. And there may be a few buildings out there that are very high EUIs in this case, uh, but frankly, there's such a small part of total energy, that's not necessarily where you're going to begin. Now, you eventually want to get to it all, of course, but this is just a first uh, prioritization exercise. Uh, we did the same thing for gas. I don't need to spend more time on that. So um, what we started with then is once we did that portfolio analysis, so we you know, came up with, we said, all right, we're going to look at these six or seven buildings um, and try to do some action-oriented benchmarking of those buildings. And to start with, what, we got, what I'm going to present today a little bit is um, uh, two buildings in particular. Uh, this is, we just call it building two, um, chemical and material sciences, about 85,000 square feet. 
completed about 20 years ago. And uh, that's a more recent building, the Molecular Foundry. It's appeared on covers of various architectural magazines, um, quite, quite distinctive. Uh, and it also got a lead gold. Um, some definitions before we move on. Uh, a performance metric uh, is essentially a measure of performance, um, a unit of measure. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, BTUs per square foot or watts per square foot for lighting. And a benchmark is a level of performance for a given metric. So you know, 1.3 watts per square foot might be considered standard practice for lighting power density in, in, in laboratories, for example. And it's actually the California code. Title 24 says that. Um, how are benchmarks defined? Well, you could, um, your peer comparison, obviously, com uh, grading on a curve, uh, relative to standards. And um, then just in many cases, you just don't have standards. And in those cases, you, we just go to expert opinion. We've worked with many engineering firms that are you know, really doing cutting edge practice. And we've uh, asked them their opinions on you know, what do you consider best practice uh, for watts per CFM or watts per square foot. And, and, and we use those as benchmarks as well. OK, so let's start down again, starting from the top. Uh, the first is, of course, whole building energy intensity. That's a classic metric. We all know about that. Um, site and source BTUs per square foot. The benchmarks would be relative to peer buildings. And in the case of laboratories, um, the, the, the bad news is that there isn't, for instance, an energy star rating for laboratories. You can't go and benchmark your laboratory building in Portfolio Manager and get, uh, get what its rating is. Um, but we do have the Labs 21 database, um, which has about 170 facilities in it. And you can begin to benchmark uh, your building at least against the buildings in that particular data set. So for example, you can also slice and dice the data set. This is uh, Climate Zone 3A, San Francisco, lab area ratio of 0 0.2 to 0.4. And you can see the average for this set was about 512 kBTUs per square foot per year across this. And what's interesting here is that this is building two, the old building that we had. Um, and it was uh, about the average in 2001. And then in, obviously, some measures were done over the last few years. And it's, it's down, actually, doing reasonably well, compared, at least compared to this particular set. This is the new building. Um, and it's obviously got some issues, and so, despite getting lead gold. And, so, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but but th this is a very first quick way of understanding, well, where, where do I stand? And when you see a new lead gold building sort of sitting at the upper end of this uh, group, you know, well, obviously something's going on, and I need to investigate this a little further. So let's look at ventilation rates. Uh, that's the first, well, often the first place we start in laboratories because it's a big opportunity. And again, um, uh, one metric, which we actually don't prefer too much, is air changes per hour. Um, but it's one that people are very familiar with. And uh, what we suggest is that if you're, oops, um, if you're in the you know, above six air changes per hour as what you're using for your minimum, well, that probably means you've got some efficiency opportunity. These are the ranges specified in various guides and standards, and those tend to be very wide, and it doesn't necessarily mean that more is better or safer. So it's important to question that, and um, obviously the actions here are to optimize the ventilation rate, both in occupied as well as un unoccupied mode. Um, the second metric on that is actually CFM per square foot, which we suggest is probably a better metric and the actual one that appears in code often. Um, and here, if you're above one uh, CFM per square foot, at the, in terms, this is net square foot, so one CFM per square foot of lab area, then you're probably, you've probably got some efficiency opportunities there uh, because that's the actually, uh, actual IBC H5 classification. And um, again, the actions are the same, of course. What we did here is that this is often a difficult metric to get to um, in laboratories, because if you have an existing lab, you may not actually have a measurement of the airflow going to the lab. You may not even have an ex exact measurement of the square footage of the lab. Um, that's another interesting benchmarking story which, issue, which is, uh, you know, do you even have proper um, uh, count of area in buildings? Even that's hard to get, get to sometimes. But anyway, so in building 67, for instance, we found that the building-wide uh, air change rate. So if you just took the total supply air, or exhaust air, I think we use in this case, to the building and divided by the total building square footage, that's including offices and all these other spaces, it was already well above one CFM per square foot. So it clearly tells you something's going on here. Um, and if you just looked at the lab, it was about 3.5 CFM per square foot. Now, there may be legitimate reasons for this. If you're a very intensive fume hood driven lab, that could be legitimate. But it, what, what benchmarking begins to point to is that, well, let's look at that a little further. And that's an area of, for perhaps a more detailed analysis and audit. Um, in the case of building two, si similar story. Um, the lab and the general was, was, was pretty high. Uh, the next area, which is more, again, a programmatic one, is, has to do with fume hood density. 
Uh, this is looking at the number of hoods per square foot. This again is not so much an efficiency opportunity, it's a conservation opportunity. It's to ask, do you really need that hood? Uh, health and safety officers will tell you a hood is only needed for active experimentation that has fumes. That's what hoods are for. They're not for storing lunches or anything else, right? So, so clearly, the, what you need to do then is to just look at whether that, th there might be an opportunity there. This is some data from, uh, these are some data from um, actually some, uh, the uh, UCCSU Monitoring-Based Commissioning Program, where we just looked at overall fume hood density in various types of facilities. And it varies widely, and again, it, it, the, these are very fuzzy benchmarks, because they may be, again, very legitimate reasons why certain buildings just happen to have a lot of fume hoods, because of the nature of research going on. But the point is that if you're a um, you know, medical research or a, some sort of a mixed-use uh, building, and you're up there in terms of your fume hood density, well, maybe it's, maybe it's something that's worth looking at programmatically, uh, whether, you really, whether you're able to shut down some hoods. Um, this is where Building 2 and Building 67 were, so they look pretty reasonable and, and probably suggest that there's not much opportunity there. Um, then the next thing comes, once you've reduced the actual number of fume hoods, is to look at, at the actual sash management uh, of those fume hoods. And here, um, there are different metrics. A more, uh, an, an ideal metric is the first one that you see listed there, which is um, average CFM to um, uh, average airflow over minimum airflow. And the closer that number is to one, the better you are. So if a fume hood was closed all the time, uh, it would essentially have a sash management ratio of one. Um, uh, as you open it more and more, leave it, leave it open more and more, it's, uh, it's obviously going to be much higher than one. Um, but if that's hard to get, because that's often hard to measure, um, you might just do a simple survey of the lab and see the percentage of sashes that are closed in unoccupied hoods. It should be 100%. Right? If you're not occupying a hood, it, the sash should always be closed. So it's, if it's less than 100%, then you've obviously got a problem. Um, what we, uh, here's one example of how we use this, the first metric um, at Duke University in, in North Carolina, where they happen to have a nice system where you could actually monitor um, the sash, uh, uh, the airflow rates in, in, the, in the hoods, and so really look at sash management ratio. And what they looked at was just simple training, where they looked at the sash management ratio pre-training, it was about 0.9, and then they did some simple sash management training. It was a grad student in turn going around telling them, hey, close your sashes. Here's how you do it. And here's a little sticker that you can put on your, on your hood. And a drop. Uh, you know, it, it dropped on pretty significantly, actually. Now, of course, the challenge is always to keep this up, because people will go back to old habits. So you, you know, how, how much you need to retrain is, is obviously a, uh, another question there. Um, but it clearly shows the impact of simple sash management training. And if that doesn't work, of course, if you just have no trust in training, then you, of course, have to go to um, occupancy-driven sash management, such as um, automatic closure or drop-in airflow rates and so on. Um, then coming to the actual ventilation system airflow efficiency, a metric that we use is uh, watts per CFM. And uh, here we um, actually work with an engineering firm, uh, Rumsey Engineers, to help define some uh, practices, standard good and better practices. And we published a best practice guide, a Lab 21 best practice guide with them on defining what these are. But what these data are shown here are actually data from the Labs 21 database on various, um, uh, of, for various laboratories that were in our database. And what's interesting is, again, the wide range. There are uh, very efficient laboratories as, as, as low as 0.3 watts per CFM. And here, there's something that's 2 watts per CFM. So really, a huge difference in terms of the range of efficiency of how you move air um, through the system. And the big actions that come out of this by analyzing this would be um, uh, efficient fans, of course, motors, belts, drives, and, and looking at low pressure drop um, a system. That's hard to do in a retrofit circumstance, although I actually heard, in fact, here at UCSB several years ago that they, for instance, found unnecessary components in the airstream. And they were able to remove those and thereby reduce the pressure drop and, uh, and increase that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that, that gets to the next question. It's ideally, you know, you'd, you'd look at both those numbers. It's often hard to get to, though. So what we suggest is as a starting point, at least get your installed watts per CFM and get a sense for what's going on. Um, sometimes you'd often, from the motor control center, you'd at least have, get a sense of what the peak watts is, and then CFM would require a real measurement, or if you don't have that, at least use the rated CFM. So there's going to be some fuzziness in those numbers. So based on the, what number you're working with, you'd uh, you know, calibrate accordingly. Um, that's building 67. So building 67 was doing, the lead goal building again, was doing pretty okay in terms of the watts per CFM area. 
Um, and then pressure drop is, again, a component that feeds into that. I'm not going to spend time on this um, again. The, but, but some of the retrofit strategies here would be low pressure drop filters uh, and components and remove unnecessary obstructions if you can. Um, on the cooling and heating side, uh, the metrics, frankly, for laboratories aren't any different than you would do in any other building type. They're the classic ones, kilowatts watts, uh, per, per ton for chiller system efficiency and PLV. Uh, boiler efficiency, pumping efficiency, and so on. So I'm not going to spend time on those. But uh, there are some special additional considerations for labs that um, are worth looking at a little bit more. One has to do with the thermal environment itself, temperature and humidity set points. Um, and here, the important point is, you know, just like Dale was saying with data centers where you're, you can keep it unnecessarily cool, that may be your first opportunity. It's the same thing with labs. You may be having unnecessarily tight tolerances and always question whether you really need those tight tolerances. If it's only two pieces of equipment in the whole laboratory that need that tight tolerance, well, put those two pieces of equipment in a special room with a tight tolerance. Don't, don't you know, condition the whole laboratory to that very tight tolerance. Because tight tolerances almost invariably will lead to high energy use, especially if you have a VAV reheat system. Um, so uh, the, the goal here, again, was, is look at those. And if there's an opportunity to widen them, obviously you want to do that. With building two, for instance, we found they had a very tight tolerance. So we're going to look at relaxing essentially what that 70-72, basically, is what they're trying to control it to. Whether they actually do that is a different question, of course. But that's what they're trying. And uh, by trying that, obviously, it's going to be uh, energy intensive. Same thing with relative humidity. Um, uh, don't control it to more than what's really needed, either for human comfort or for experimentation. I'm going to uh, skip over that. Uh, the next one is on chiller system modulation. So this is looking at the whole issue of turndown ratios uh, for your chiller system. And what we're suggesting, well, the, the, the problem here is that, again, if your chiller does not have a good turndown ratio, meaning if, if it can't turn down low, then um, you're going to have unnecessarily, unnecessary false loading in order to be able to manage control. And uh, here again, just expert opinion. We can debate these numbers, whether that's considered low, medium, high in terms of efficiency opportunity. I mean, you know, those are all debatable. The point is, let's have a metric and let's have a, have a debate around what's the appropriate number. And what's interesting um, here was that with building 67, that was the specification. They said the, chill, the manufacturers working with the designers said, we can get to 0 0.5, 0.05, 5% 5 basically turned on. In reality, that's what's happening. For whatever reason, there's a bunch of issues which are not fully understood yet, but uh, they're in the process of trying to figure it out. But that's what's, well, that's what's happening in reality. And the problem now is that, again, because we have very low, uh, or we don't have adequate turndown ratio, what's essentially happening is that a lot of the time, they're preheating the outside, uh, preheating the outside air to create a false load for the chiller. And that's what's creating huge amounts of natural gas consumption in buildings. Completely artificial, again, in the lead gold building, by the way, and which uh, ends up you know, having a very high energy intensity, as we saw earlier. So again, uh, uh, and this is a metric that can help with that. But these are kind of the small things, quote, small things, that can really mess up your whole energy uh, picture. And again, it's exacerbated in laboratories because of various control issues. So important to look at that. Um, then, of course, simultaneous heating and cooling is a big problem in lab or can be a big problem in laboratories. What's a metric for it? We don't really have one, not, not a really standard one out there. We've tried to create or define one, what we call reheat energy use factor. It's sort of the ratio of how much energy goes to reheating previously chilled air over the total heating energy. The problem is that it's usually very hard to measure how much energy is going to heating, uh, going to reheating. So we don't really have a metric, and that's you know, something for us as a community to try and, 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 and define an appropriate metric for capturing how much energy goes to reheat. Because again, big problem in laboratories. Uh, Labs 21's in fact published a best practice guide. But we do know that the best practice for this factor, were we to define it, is zero. And there are buildings, laboratory buildings, that have been designed with literally zero reheat. Uh, even in humid climates, uh, th there's a building out in, uh, Pencil in Phil just south of Philadelphia that uh, they literally turn off the heat to the building in summer. So they literally don't need any reheat uh, in that building. And uh, there's a, we published a best practice guide on that and a case study on that. So if you'd like to see how they actually did that. They had, the, the key here is, of course, zone-based controls. Uh, so you don't have central uh, cooling and heating, but you have zone-based cooling and heating um, with, with heat recovery and so on. 
Um, and then I should be cognizant of time here. The uh, equipment loads are another uh, important metric in laboratories. Uh, often the problem here is that they're often oversized. This metric, frankly, applies more to new construction. And the message is simply, don't overestimate equipment loads. They're often grossly overestimated. We took measurements from 39 different laboratory spaces. And we found, again, that these are what you're actually seeing in watts per net square foot in labs. Sure, equipment rooms can get high. But don't design the whole laboratory to 12 watts per square foot or 10 watts per square foot. Because again, if most of you are, if you're having chem labs, it may only be at 4 watts per square foot. So negotiate that. Um, and then I'm going to skip over lighting. It's fairly straightforward. Um, uh, although the one thing with lighting, again, is that just like you don't want to overestimate equipment loads, don't overestimate lighting requirements. You will still see labs designed to 100 foot candles, task, illuminance, not needed. The latest IESNA actually indicates 50 foot candles as the required. Uh, and that was a drop from the previous version, which had 75 foot candles. So uh, again, question if you really need. If you see 100 foot candles in a spec, question it and see if you really need it. So the point is that uh, you, you can define a set of metrics, um, uh, really a suite of metrics, to help identify potential actions um, in, la in laboratories. And, and you know, the, 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 again, the point here is to get beyond whole building benchmarking, but you're not trying to get a whole investment grade audit. You're trying to do something in between to help prioritize where you want to focus your audit activities. Um, and important to note, again, that action-oriented benchmarking, is, it's not an audit in a box. It cannot replace you know, real, uh, people, experts, actually visiting a building and walking around and, and, and taking detailed measurements. But it's a way, as, as I mentioned earlier, to help prioritize. Um, in terms of getting started with it on your campus, uh, obviously, it's important to help define metrics, set benchmarks for those, um, and consider integration with existing non-energy benchmarking systems or KPI, uh, key performance indicators. That, that you may have. Um, and then, of course, you, know, you don't collect metrics as an end in themselves. It's, it's important to look at how you're actually going to use that information and determine ahead of time so that you don't go on an unnecessary data, data collection exercise. A uh, couple of resources that I want to leave with you. Uh, one is the Labs 21 benchmarking tool. I mentioned that earlier. That's for both whole building and system level benchmarking. Um, it has about 170 facilities in it right now that you can compare. And many of them are actually in California climate zone. So there's a pretty rich data set for California. Uh, and then we also have all the different, uh, the previous charts that I showed you uh, with those metrics and data definitions. We have uh, published a best practice guide and a template. And that's the website, again, for that. Um, so you can use that. Um, there's an Excel spreadsheet that gives you all the data that you'd need to collect for these different metrics and, and so on. Um, and then we're going to be developing actually a new tool that's coming down the pike um, where we're uh, actually, it's actually going to take a step by step walkthrough to help identify the potential efficiencies, essentially beginning to codify a little bit this actual process. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, yep. First of all, I want to thank everyone, uh, thank the conference organizers for allowing uh, Stanford to participate in this conference. It's a really terrific event, and we really um, appreciate the opportunity to present the results of um, some work that we've been doing on our campus um, to explore alternatives to our current way of storing biological samples. So I'll give you a second to get that pulled up. OK, yes, the title of our talk is trying to win the Cold War uh, by using um, room temperature biological sample storage. Um, but for a little bit of introduction, uh, since we're kind of the outsider here, I thought I'd give a little bit an overview of, of Stanford University. I mean, I know you may have heard of it, but we aren't. Um, uh, but we are a private teaching institution. Um, just to kind of give you some um, points of comparison to maybe the institutions that you're coming from is that there really aren't that many students. There's only 6,800 undergrads, 8,300 graduate students, 1,400 faculty, and tons of staff, I'm, me being one of them. Um, and uh, also another point of comparison, tuition has really gone through the roof, um, as you may be aware. Um, and we, but we have a lot, for having relatively few number of students, we have a lot of building space, um, 12 million square feet of buildings. And a lot of those are research facilities that typical undergraduate might never step foot in during the four years that they're there. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that's, um, that is research-based. Um, 1.4 million of that is laboratory and support space. Um, so I, I brought a few trivia questions just to liven things up. Third talk, you know, you need to think a little bit. So how many, who out there knows what our official Stanford mascot is? 
Bill? The cardinal, yeah, it's a color. Isn't that lame? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you're talking about the unofficial mascot, which is the tree, who you may have seen bouncing around on the um, basketball field, which is also lame, but at least it's something tangible. Um, and finally, does anybody, you, you may have your own nicknames for Stanford, but what is sort of the, 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 the kind nickname that we have? The farm, that's it. So I brought pictures of those just to sort of orient you to, to the university a little bit. Yeah, the farm because um, the, the property was originally Leland Stanford's um, trotting horse uh, farm, and he converted to the, uh, the university. So um, like I said, it's, a, it's a in research institution, and as a result, we've got a lot of um, biological and medical research going on that generates a lot of, of, of samples of things, everything from DNA to RNA, proteins, tissues, blood, and all this stuff that the researchers want to keep. And the way that they've um, always done it, if they want to keep something for a long time, is they put it in a freezer. And not just like your garden variety home freezer, we're talking really heavy duty, um, low temperature freezers, ultra low temperature freezers um, on the order of, um, you know, minus 80 degrees centigrade. And so these, um, these freezers do protect the samples from degradation um, as long as they're working. Um, so they're vulnerable to power outages. They'd be vulnerable in the event of an earthquake where we had a disruption because even then there's an emergency generator. How long that, is that generator going to run if you can't get de more diesel in and you have higher priority uh, needs on campus like for the adjoining hospital in our case? They're, they're not going to keep your samples cold if they've got people in the hospital who need power. So um, I think that's, uh, that's a big consideration. They also take up a lot of space. Um, and I think most universities are facing a space crunch. And these big, you know, these freezers, they just, they hog a lot of space. They put off a lot, they use a lot of energy, electricity directly. They also put off a lot of waste heat that then has to be removed to the, from the building. And so we've known for a long time that um, freezers uh, in, in the biological area particularly were a big um, driver of, uh, or a, a driver of laboratory energy use. But we didn't know that there was really anything we might be able to do about it. Um, not only that, we knew that the problem of freezers was steadily getting worse. More and more freezers coming in, um, being stuck in hallways, basements, you know, anywhere that they could find space. Um, we have this accumulation of, 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 of freezers over time. And that's just, this, this slide just shows a um, sort of a straight line trajectory based on historical levels of freezer growth. Um, but we actually expect the problem to become much worse. The blue lines here um, show the number of freezers that are anticipated as, um, as things change. We actually expect to have a lot of uh, growth in um, explosive growth in the generation of biological samples for a couple different reasons. One being that our medical school faculty is expected to grow. Uh, the type of research that they're doing, like population studies and stem cell research, tends to generate more samples. And also, automated laboratory processes um, allow them to generate and use, make use of a lot more samples than they used to in the past. And so we're seeing that potentially explosive growth in, the, in, um, in freezers that would be completely uns unsustainable. It's kind of like the kind of growth that we saw in IT maybe over the last decade, but, but worse because these things are humongous and they just take up a, a lot of resources. And so we figured, we heard about the opportunity that there might be an alternative to freezer-based storage. And um, we were introduced to this potential alternative, which is a room temperature uh, option it's currently only available for DNA and RNA, but there are other types of um, materials, that are, there are other products in the works. But for right now, we said, well, even if we just had DNA and RNA, maybe we could, um, th this is something we, we need to look at further. So I'll spend a moment, hopefully I won't botch this too badly, the experts are sitting in the room uh, who, who know this stuff. But anyway, the, the basic technology is um, it's sort of a, a, a look? It was sort of a it's a biomimicry, basically looking at um, there's some creatures in nature that you're able to live in a dried condition, sort of a desiccated dry storage condition for many many years, and then you add water and 
like, bing, they're back to life. It's amazing. It's kind of um, these little critters, critters called tardigrades that I have a picture of up there. But it's also something I could relate to. It's like sea monkeys. Do you guys remember those from comic book days? You know, you, you, you get these sea monkeys. They're, like, dried out. They look completely dead. And then um, you add water, and they come back to life. And this is the same idea, is that you could take a biological sample. Um, the, the company that we worked with called Biomatrica has developed sort of a chemical syn synthetic um, mimic of the same of this uh, natural based uh, technology that binds with the sample and then you can keep it you put it in a little well you can put it on a shelf don't have to refrigerate it don't have to worry about it you could send it to your colleague in Kansas so they can keep it um, a, a copy for you in case there's an earthquake in the Bay Area and then when you need it you just add water and um, it's back into its its usable form so when we heard about this um, this technology we said hey this sounds like something that has uh, some great potential for us because the vision is you could take all this stuff that you currently have in a big old freezer, pull it out of there, put it into these small well plates, um, put it in a box and stick it on a shelf. And that's sort of the vision that we had of maybe, maybe this is something that we could do, but we didn't know if it was feasible. We didn't really know what the true potential might be for our campus. Was this just sort of a little niche thing or something that could potentially have fairly broad application across a number of laboratories? And so what we did is uh, Stanford hired um, Greg Jensen of Sustainable BioVentures to conduct a pilot study to sort of assess and quantify this potential. And I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about the study. Thank you, Susan. Am I, can you hear me all right? Yeah. I'm gonna try the mic because I tend to wander around. So um, yeah, as Susan pointed out, there is a compelling opportunity here to move from freezer technology to room temperature. And I think um, as we looked at that, um, we wanted to set up a pilot study to uh, accomplish two important goals. The first was to evaluate the energy, environmental, and economic benefits of this technology, and then look at it on a campus-wide basis and see the potential magnitude, as, as she mentioned. And so what I'm going to do is give you an overview of this pilot study and what we learned and some of the best practices we hope that can help you and your institution as you think through this. So first of all, we had a couple of key objectives, um, which were pretty simple to recruit 10 laboratories to perform this transfer. And as you can see here, we had some pretty strong interest. We actually exceeded our goal and then also had a number of laboratories who were interested in the technology. Of course, we would collect and analyze the data, which uh, um, allowed us to create a detailed economic model of the benefits. And then we wanted these individual laboratories to have experience with the technology firsthand, so to validate that it was indeed um, useful in their laboratories and also experimentally sound. So we had a few laboratories in the pilot that actually did uh, studies on the technology. And then ultimately, we really wanted to see the behavior. I guess this morning, uh, we talked a lot about behavior, and, and we certainly wanted to see how biological samples could be transferred into this technology and do some evaluation on that as well. So just a quick overview of the process. It really started uh, at the top. We worked with uh, leaders in the medical school and the Department of Biology to communicate with their researchers information about this pilot program. And then we started the process of meeting with interested laboratories, um, finding out exactly what they had in terms of equipment and, and collect detailed survey data of all these laboratories, as well as uh, laboratories that would give us information. I uh, spent a lot of time right here with uh, freezer doors open, looking at what was inside. Um, the perception is that everybody knows really well what they have in their freezer. And just like you and me, uh, when you look in, it tends to surprise you what you might find. And so uh, we did a lot of uh, data um, surveying to, to understand what was out there, and then ultimately take that data and build a, an analysis tool to document the um, savings and benefits. Just a quick snapshot of the um, analysis tool we created. Uh, fortunately, we had a lot of rich data at Stanford University through the uh, Sustainability and Energy Management Group, as well as the School of Medicine, and then we complemented that with the laboratory data from our pilot participant group. And so you can see here some of the key things 
that our model considers were things like container format, different types of temperatures that storage uh, that these biological samples were in, of course, space and the cost allocated to a footprint of, a, of a, one of these large freezers, and then the specific costs in terms of capital equipment, energy, and so forth. So all of our data in this model was from robust assumptions, but also real data from Stanford, interviews of our pilot labs, and industry sources. So to give you a sense of what we did, we took the, the pilot group, which was a strong and diverse group, but not a random sample. And it was 12 laboratories, as I mentioned, with about 61 freezers. And what we found was actually pretty striking. We didn't know how many addressable samples we would have. And addressable, what I mean there is DNA and RNA at this point that we were targeting. Um, and there were about a million addressable samples just in our pilot group. So then uh, what we did is broaden that out a little bit, complemented this data set with uh, known data at Stanford that I referred to, and came up with a campus-wide uh, estimate of both the addressable samples and the potential benefits. And uh, Stanford has more than 350 wet laboratories on campus, and uh, we estimate about 2,000 freezers. That includes both these ultra-low minus 80s and the uh, minus 20s that people are typically using. And then uh, 9 to 13 million addressable samples within the collection is what we estimate. We took a conservative estimate of that. Uh, because as some of the data in the benchmarking uh, show that there, it varies wildly uh, on the specific lab that you're speaking about. And our laboratories in the pilot group had a rich sample collection, so we wanted to be fairly conservative. Ultimately, uh, though, the sample growth that uh, Susan speaks of in the future is very important. This number could be much higher with the metrics that she highlighted in terms of an annual sample growth rate of 10%. So on an annual basis, the savings are pretty significant, um, starting with the carbon di dioxide going from 900 to about 1,100 tons per year. And even with the electricity that you're seeing and the, and the chilled water uh, needed, I think these numbers are, are fairly uh, significant. Uh, with chilled water, as, as known from data centers, these uh, pieces of equipment generate a large amount of heat, and so it's important to cool those down. We did discount that for the seasons and so forth, so only took about half of what you might expect in an annual basis. And then ultimately, the economics of this drives a lot, and so savings of about 1.2 to 1.4 million would come if we were to transfer all of the samples that we predicted are out there at Stanford. So to give a sense, um, I'm not I don't have an energy background, I'm more of a life science background, but to give a sense of what the CO2 impact is, I uh, looked on the, I think the Department of Energy has equivalencies, and it's about 200, uh, the carbon footprint that we would save from transferring the samples is about the same as 200 average households and the carbon footprint generated by that, or 263 passenger vehicles. And then if you wanted to try to sequester that amount of CO2, it's uh, as it said on the, the website, that it was about 37,000 saplings grown over 10 years. So these are significant, uh, but when you look at it, even, it becomes even more significant as you look at it over a 10-year period. Uh, so what we did here is on the left side, we, we marked the dollars, the net savings of this program. And so in the first couple of years, you have some investment, and then uh, between three and five years, depending on how fast you're able to implement, you begin to see a return on your investment, and by year 10, you see a significant savings. On the right-hand side of this graph, uh, we're tracking the uh, total energy, including electricity and chilled water that is saved, and again, that's a cumulative number and is about 200,000 uh, mmBTUs. And then the cost you see on the right-hand side uh, calculates to about 16 million, uh, as well as uh, the total CO2 being 18,000. And these um, numbers, I think, are quite significant, uh, but could be much higher if more um, samples were able to be addressed over time or we were able to understand a little bit better at the potential or the number of samples that are really out there in the, in the laboratories at Stanford. So to give a sense of 
with that many addressable samples, how many ultra-low freezers we're talking about, about 253. And our, our data was based on the pilot group, so these numbers are sort of what the pilot group predicted was out there uh, based on our modeling, and uh, 105 low temperature freezers. And the interesting side benefit of freezers being removed is the total square footage, which is over 10,000 square feet of valuable lab space that could be liberated. We had a number of key observations along the way, and I probably could have gone for many slides here, so we tried to pick out those observations that led to our uh, recommendations for implementing a program. So first of all, we had, as I mentioned, a very enthusiastic response and, um, the, on all levels. And this really indicated, we believe, the conclusion really is that people are environmentally conscious. They want to participate. They're eager to find things that they can do to contribute to reducing our impact in the environment. And the second piece is people with laboratories are very uh, aware of the pain that can occur of storing things in freezers, both from the cost standpoint as well as the, the equipment failure standpoint. They're paranoid about how these uh, freezers could crash on them. And in fact, many, have to carry, many lab managers have to carry beepers with them over the weekend in case a freezer goes down, and that's not uncommon. Even with this enthusiastic interest, we did see that laboratories were slow to transfer samples, ultimately. And the challenge here is really about the number of samples. As I mentioned, there were a large number of samples in our pilot group. And it's very hard to transfer a lot of samples and figure out the time and fit it into your workflow. So what we figured out there is that we, it was really essential, we learned this early on, to partner with uh, laboratories on campus that serve your research community. And these are, um, uh, a, this is a picture of a liquid handling arm, something that Susan alluded to in the new research wave of, of you know, high volume sample generation. And these service facilities on campus, they're called core facilities, and they have a number of these uh, research robots to help process samples. And so in our pilot, we were able to partner with one of the larger ones on campus and help facilitate the sample transfer, which was important. Another revelation uh, right here is just how valuable these biological samples are. They're incredibly precious. Many of them represent clinical trials that have gone on in unique disease areas. And these samples are not only important to the life research of the researcher, but also to the next um, great discovery and, and, and potential patent. And so the, the value of the samples is very high. So one of the key benefits uh, to this room temperature storage is that you uh, avoid sort of this vulnerability in freezers and, and as Su Susan alluded to earlier. And then ultimately, uh, the frozen environment is challenging. If you've ever seen a researcher go into one of these ultra-low freezers, they have to wear thick, thick orange gloves often that you would only wear if you were um, you know, at very extreme conditions. And it's hard to find your samples in there. It's very dark and cold. And uh, when you move out and you liberate yourself from that environment, there's a lot of um, flexibility and a potential. This is an example of one of the hallways that has many uh, minus 80 freezers at Stanford. This one happens to be called Rumbling Thunder. It's, uh, I believe, over 20 years old or something, so particularly interesting. I won't go through all of these uh, in interest of time, but just to highlight a couple, um, as I mentioned before, we, we thought it was very important to build a strong par partnership with both leadership in the medical school and biology right off the bat, and establishing a program that really takes advantage of opportunities of change within research, either times when people retire, new hires, uh, and when they're generating these samples. We actually found in one of our pilot laboratories that they were hosting a freezer of a Nobel laureate, and I thought that was interesting. So there are t uh, times when uh, freezers move and, um, and are perhaps relocated on campus that could be potential opportunities to take advantage of sample transfer. And it, uh, it's really essential, in number three, to uh, properly incent everybody in, in the system, as well as uh, number four, in developing this, as I mentioned, a complementary service program with uh, one of these core or service lab facilities. And then throughout the um, program, really to give feedback on how the program is doing with the participants, 
And finally, um, it's important with one of these programs to have ongoing management within the schools to, to really have oversight of this so that there's a dedicated person to uh, commit to it. So with that, it's very important uh, for Susan and I to, to compliment a lot of people that pr uh, contributed to this project who are not here, uh, but it certainly was a valiant effort by people from uh, both the Energy Management Group as well as the School of Medicine and Biology and even the Business School. And I should also uh, acknowledge the folks from the partner company that Susan mentioned, Biometrica, and they are here to give and answer questions, have a booth uh, here if you're interested in finding more about their technology. So with that, um, we could certainly, Susan and I can really take a couple questions if you have some. Do we have a couple of minutes? We do have one that is from Liana Hauser, and she's interested, or actually asking if anything um, that you've provided here is in a peer-reviewed journal in which this technology has been employed and cited. Good question. Um, Greg, can you answer that? Uh, Greg Ford so, is sitting in there, and it's about a peer-reviewed journal. Maybe, maybe you know Greg yeah, as well. So the question Greg. was whether or not uh, any t about the technology has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Greg Ford, do you happen to know uh, the answer to that question? So while the microphone's going, we do know that there have been a number of studies uh, published, and at Stanford we had a number of laboratories that actually did experimentation on the technology. There's been a number of uh, publications, or a number of posters presented at scientific meetings, and we have a publication that's coming out in Biotechniques, which is a peer-reviewed journal, and that I'm not sure exactly when that's coming out, but uh, about a week ago we got notification that it was accepted, so that should be hitting the hitting the papers within a month or so. Yeah, and I think it's important to emphasize that the, the, the primary purpose of our study was not to validate the technology, although some of the labs did do validation testing on their own, um, but we felt there was enough reliable data um, out there already that people could have confidence that the technology was basically was going to work for them, and we just really wanted to understand, well, if it does work, what's the potential for the university to, to have all these other benefits? Right here. Yeah, so the question was, and maybe I should restate it just to make sure, um, did, did initially when we approached scientists about this, did they have skepticism to using the technology? Um, I've never met a scientist that was skeptic. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I met a lot of them, and, and you're exactly right. Uh, there, there was skepticism, but I think as uh, we sort of brought the technical expertise of, of Biometrica, and there's certainly a lot out there about um, the technology that Biometrica uses. The company has been around for about four years, so it is a new company, uh, but they do have a significant partnership with a company that many of your scientists are familiar with named Kyogen, and so there was some validation in that process, and certainly it's a mainstream product, even though it is new. Uh, so there, there was comfort in that, but as any scientist would, they, they really did, a lot of them want to test, okay, I get it, there's, there's, there's good data out there, but I want to see it in my hands. And so we actually have uh, one lab doing an extended uh, study and other labs that have uh, just recently released some of the studies that went on during this pilot, which concluded about February. So they've been doing some of that study. Yep. I'm just going to add a comment, excuse me, as we're wrapping up our session, please feel free to ask questions for Del Sarder or Paul Matthew as well. Um, we were going to have a little panel Q&A. We're running out of time a little bit, but you can direct questions to any of our panelists. Thank you. So question back here. So, um, I, I Maybe you answered this in the presentation, but I, I, I'm a little unclear on this uh, uh, technology or this strategy. Would all of the freezers that Stanford has be eligible? Because I know that some folks are storing plant samples, not DNA. Right. So, and, and if it doesn't apply, how, what percent do you think ultimately does it apply to? What's the potential? That's a great, uh, great question, and we looked at that fairly closely that um, in an at, if you just approach a lab, you, you really don't know until you understand what they're working with. And we found that on average, uh, between 
20, 15 to 20 percent of the samples in any given freezer would, would have, uh, be addressable by this technology. Uh, but what we actually found is the perception was that they didn't have a lot of addressable samples and they ended up having more than we thought. So that was an interesting opportunity. And then the, just the exercise of finding out what's in people's freezers uh, could have other benefits, including efficiency opportunities. And as products continue to come out that can address uh, additional samples, that can uh, sort of improve the magnitude. So we're talking about you know, 20 percent of the samples at Stanford, because you're absolutely right. Uh, the big one they kept asking about was protein and different types of blood, sura. Uh, there's certainly many freezers full of that. Um, just wondered if you had your risk management people um, take a look at, you know, the, the benefits to reliability and if there was any um, financial um, benefit that they saw in this technology. Well, the, the risk management folks at, uh, in the School of Medicine were very excited about this. Um, they thought it, it would just be fantastic if, if everyone would it, move as many samples as possible. Um, and they thought it was actually an opportunity to force people to make an inventory, because they don't even know what they've got out there. I mean, that's the sad part, is they, they can't seem to force them to take inventory. So like, well, this would be a great chance to get them to take an inventory so we know what's there, and also get, get some of their stuff into a more secure, um, secure storage medium. And uh, so they loved it, but they didn't have any resources to put behind it, which is the sad part. So maybe that'll be forthcoming down the road. And that, yeah, that was a major part of the appeal of this to that group, and we did meet with them. Great, a question over here. I wanted to thank all three speakers. I thought this was an excellent presentation. I've gone to several of these lab um, presentations before as a, the sustainability officer for my campus, and I, I finally felt like I understood all of the, the per options that were being presented. But I wanted to ask a question that kind of may require you to talk together. It, what's the next thing that I should do? Should I be focusing on fume hoods, on ventilation, on my data center, on the cooling? Is it the storage sample? Like, what's, what's the first big thing or the next big thing that I should do on this if I can only, you know, if I've got to start somewhere? Dale, do you want to tackle are that? You talking, are you talking new construction or retrofit? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we are going to be speaking on the Friday session on CI, and I think that in the existing university laboratories, the air change rate is probably the biggest opportunity and lowest hanging fruit. But, you know, it's really good. I was just say that the exercise that Paul showed of, of lining up your buildings by gross energy use and then overlaying energy intensity, I think that will give you a good clue. Because if at the top, you know, where those high bars are, are your, your laboratory facilities, well then, um, and they happen to be medical, maybe, maybe the freezers is something you want to look at, or air changes. If those high-end facilities happen to be your data centers, then maybe you need to go after some of that. So that might help with the prioritization process. One other cell point. I, I'd agree. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> One other sell point for the working with the laboratories is that you can address maybe the fume hood or freezers kind of all at the same time. And what we're finding is with the new construction, that's a really important issue for these uh, scientists uh, as they think about not being able to have two or three freezers, but just one. And so they're really facing that, uh, you know, currently. And, and when you move a sample out of a freezer, it starts saving energy as soon as you turn off the freezer as opposed to a long construction time, so. Yeah, one important uh, point that Paul made on the uh, fume hoods about how they're used can be carried over to the laboratories and it relates to the air change rate because, you know, there's a lot of laboratory space that's not being used as a laboratory, just like there's a lot of fume hoods that aren't being used as fume hoods. So um, reevaluating how your space is used and perhaps, you know, rezoning the building and, and focusing you know, the, the rooms that need 100% outside air and only provide 100% outside air to those rooms and dramatically reducing the fresh air uh, requirements of the others is, is another big opportunity. All right, great, we have a question here in the back. Uh, on the air, air change rates for the science buildings on your exhaust fans, uh, is there any discussion on how to turn down the discharge velocity on the exhaust fans and still be within compliance other yeah. than using a waste gate? 
Right. No, that's a good question. In fact, that is in our in, in the big list of metrics that we've developed. That's actually one of them too. I just didn't go over it um, today because we didn't have enough time to cover all the metrics. Uh, but for instance, on both these buildings that we looked at LBNL, the discharge velocity was uh, 3,500 feet per minute, which is probably high. I mean, it, it could be lowered. But the thing is, again, uh, that just identifies that there might be an opportunity to actually do it. There's no, you know. It, it requires a detailed analysis with, you know, probably wind tunnel modeling and so on and so forth to really figure out if you can lower it beyond that. So there's, there's no simple half-pregnant way to do it, so to speak, you know. So. Pardon me? Well, that's a good question. We know it's a three, we, yeah, exactly. We know it's 3,500 feet per minute. Whether it's actually, yeah, it depends upon what, how one defines compliance. It's, it's in compliance in terms of velocity. But that's very different in terms of being compliance for, in terms of pollution. So uh, I, we don't really know, actually. Yeah. Great. Now, question right here, Alan. Susan, well, could you go ahead and repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. He's asking what, what kind of incentive program we've put into place and whether it's integrated with in, any kind of software tool to help with sample inventory and management. And actually, we're, we're working on that right now. Um, we literally are trying to pull together that program at the, as we speak. Hopefully, I'll be able to talk to you about it next year. Um, but, but what we're looking at is we're hoping to contribute a, a portion of an incentive for, for retiring old freezers um, out of our utility energy efficiency money and then um, also supplement that with money that's coming from the School of Medicine because they realize there's a lot of benefit to them as a school to get this to happen and so what we're trying to do at least initially is making it kind of a cost neutral decision in terms of the equipment the researchers will still have to put in the effort and possibly technician time and you know some mental effort to make it happen but we're trying to at least make it cost neutral from an equipment standpoint we haven't really talked about the software too much. Um, I don't know that the School of Medicine is ready to standardize on any, they'd be happy if they had anything, really. Um, but, um, but I don't know if they've started talking about standardizing or using a particular software uh, tool to manage these inventories or not. I'm not, I'm not really, really sure. Great. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and take one last question and try to stick to our uh, on-time performance today. All right. I just wanted to add to uh, Dale's long list of improvements that can be made in data centers, uh, and it was in your uh, kind of uh, ending there about DC power infrastructure. Um, the two things that you would pick up in addition to everything else is reliability, significant uh, improvement in reliability in the system and also um, the ability to directly couple in alternate energy sources, particularly on campus, solar, wind turbine, and so on, because they're all native DC generators. So you pick up about another 15% off those uh, uh, sources because you don't have to invert to put an AC, and you, you, you charted the rest of it downhill, downhill from there. And we are, I happen to be the chairman of the eMERGE Alliance, which is creating DC power standards for buildings. and. Um, we're trying to bring the data center in with the occupied space and create a hybrid layer of DC power for all uh, buildings. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and everyone on the web. And let's thank our speakers.